So as chair of um, the Bar of Northern Ireland, I am delighted that um, we are able to support the annual human rights uh, lecture. I want to welcome you all here to um, the Inn of Court and I extend a particularly warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Gillian Triggs. Uh, Gillian is, of course, uh, Assistant Secretary General to the United Nations and uh, in that role, uh, an Assistant High Commissioner for Protection. Now, I am aware that uh, Alison will um, introduce uh, Gillian in some detail, um, but, but I do wish to say that uh, Gillian is obviously a most distinguished international lawyer uh, who has held a number of appointments in service uh, to human rights and the refugee cause, uh, including as president of the uh, Australian uh, Human Rights Commission. And in July 2021, Gillian was awarded a Ruth Bader Ginsburg Inaugural Medal of Honour in recognition of her fight for the rule of law and gender equality. Now, respect for the rule of law and human rights are obviously central to the protection of refugees, returnees and stateless persons. And I really do look forward to hearing uh, what Gillian has to say today uh, on these matters. But for now, uh, I would like to introduce uh, the Lady Chief Justice here in Northern Ireland, Dame Siobhan Keegan, uh, who will make uh, some introductory remarks and open this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maura. Um, it is an immense pleasure for me to be asked again to open the annual Human Rights Commission lecture. This annual lecture attracts internationally recognised speakers, plays an important part in promoting human rights in Northern Ireland. I am therefore honoured to be part of it again. I want to extend my own personal welcome to Dr Gillian Triggs. I'm looking forward very much to hearing what Dr Triggs has to say this evening, um, particularly about new thinking on global refugee protection. It is a timely topic, it seems to me, and I'm sure her lecture will be uh, informative, interesting and give us some food for thought. When I addressed this annual lecture previously, I spoke about the context in which discussions about human rights in Northern Ireland arises. I make no apology for saying that I think it's important to re-emphasize that context. First, to consider some of the broader history. We must remember that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was formulated 75 years ago. The subsequent establishment of the Council of Europe in 1949 was part of the Allies programme to reconstruct a durable civilization. That was, of course, a laudable aim, but one that proved difficult to achieve perfectly in an ever-changing world where conflicts arose. Another key historical milestone was in 1959. That year saw the signing of the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms by Council of Europe members. Closer to home, 25 years ago in 1998, we saw the passing of the Human Rights Act. And in the same year, the signing of the Belfast or Good Friday Agreement here in Northern Ireland. That agreement, of course, is prefaced upon the European Convention on Human Rights. And so it follows that the protection of human rights in Northern Ireland continues to frame our law. The Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission was established as part of the outworkings of the 1998 agreement. Since its inception, the Commission has played a key role in protecting and promoting the human rights of everyone in Northern Ireland through education, 
including events such as these, through participation in and support of legal proceedings, and through advice to government. In the period since the 1998 agreement, we have seen the development of an increasing rights-based jurisprudence in this jurisdiction. Cases coming before the Northern Ireland courts, the Court of Appeal in particular, regularly feature a human rights dimension. This evening's theme of refugee protection is timely, as I have said, as the world views scenes of refugees in desperation, crossing dangerous seas to reach uh, safety, and in the midst of proposed legislative changes to deal ostensibly with an increasing number of refugees. On a general level, may I say that this subject matter, it seems to me, calls for a reduction in any harmful rhetoric which can arise and a focus on timely decision making, cognizant of the rights of refugees, including children. As I said previously at a debate about uh, uh, the uh, legislation that is proposed, we must also always reflect on the rule of law as a guiding principle, which is a worldwide and well understood uh, principle. I want to just briefly mention the issue of children in this area because I note from some of the statistics that I have read that 40% of the displaced people in 2022 were children below 18 years of age and that between 2018 to 2022, an average of 385,000 children were born as refugees. Of course, the underpinning of refugee law is humanitarian protection. People throughout history have had to move from their countries of origin due to fear of persecution. That is nothing new. However, the United Nations codified a working practice in 1951 with the Refugee Convention following the large displacement of people following the World War II. The world has of course changed since then However, people continue to be displaced due to persecution. Our courts have heard cases on a constant and consistent basis in this area at tribunal level, and some cases have reached the higher courts. You will know about the definition of refugee in the 1951 uh, convention. You will also know about the principle of refoulement, a person's right not to be refouled to the place um, of persecution. Article 33 of the 1951 Geneva Convention is core because it sets out the prohibition of expulsion or return. I'm going to mention three recent cases heard by the Court of Appeal in Northern Ireland very briefly, which I think also illustrate the challenges faced in this area and the interplay between the Geneva Convention and other international instruments. The first is a case of AB, which was heard recently and decided by the Court of Appeal. In that case, the Court of Appeal had to consider the Geneva Convention alongside the Hague Convention on Child Abduction. The issue came to the court uh, on an appeal against the decision of the High Court to stay an order made under the Hague Convention, uh, given the asylum context. AB, the child in the case, had been born in Switzerland after her parents, since divorced, had settled there after leaving their country of birth, Eritrea. It was from that country that asylum was claimed. And we looked in the judgment at the um, interplay, as I've said, between the international conventions and decided that the stay was inappropriate in that case. We only decided that, however, um, after guarantees of safety from Switzerland and a consideration that that was a safe country uh, for the child to return to for the consideration of her welfare case. A second case I mention uh, briefly as a case of Said, which was heard by the Court of Appeal. This is a ruling which reiterates the protections that every asylum applicant enjoys, protections uh, conferred by the Refugee Convention and the reception directive 
and related provisions of UK law. In addition to the right to determination of an application for refugee status and the protection against non-refoulement pending such determination, the case highlights the right to certain facilities and support, services of an interpreter, copies of interview notes, effective opportunities to consult a lawyer and such like. And that's again a timely reminder of the practical need to assist those uh, in this area. The last case I mentioned is a family law case. Uh, that is a case uh, of um, Belfast Trust uh, versus SB. And why I mention this case is that the asylum issues also crossed over with issues of extradition and potential trafficking. The decision in that case, though, was rooted in what was best for a young child who had, in fact, spent all of her life in custody in Northern Ireland for over three years, whilst decisions were made uh, about her future and her mother's extradition to France. I think it's fair to say that a feature of all of these cases have been delays in determining issues. And that seems to be, to me, a perennial issue in this area. If I may mention one other uh, factor, having just returned from the uh, Commonwealth Conference of Magistrates and Judges, the issue of interpret interpretation for peoples um, having their cases heard, uh, not in their uh, mother tongue, arose quite poignantly for me the point raised was procedural rights and substantive rights and the need for effective interpretation services that pick up sometimes cultural nuances and issues of understanding. Looking to the future, another area and, and finally, um, I think of potential interplay um, is that of asylum law and climate change justice. I've spoken previously about what Shifra O'Leary, the president of the European Court of Human Rights, terms a rising tide of climate change litigation around the world. Current cases are not only strategic, seeking to challenge government policy and achieve change in that way, but also individualistic, engaging rights such as the right to life and the right to respect for private and family life. The natural disasters we see occurring around the world are obviously catastrophic for people. But such events, it seems to me, can also have very personal impacts and sometimes lead to conflict and persecution. I wonder whether climate change could therefore be a driver for the forced displacement of persons and the seeking of refuge. I know that this is a matter of concern for the UN Refugee Agency. Undoubtedly, Dr. Trigg's lecture this evening will illuminate further on where we are and where we are going in this very important area of law, which affects many lives across the world. Thank you. So I would like, uh, if I may, to add my welcome to you all and thank you for sharing your time and interest in what is a critical and very timely topic, uh, as Lady Chief Justice has said. Thank you to Maura Smith, Casey, uh, Chair of the Bar uh, of Northern Ireland, and to all our colleagues at the Bar who once again have supported us. So we're very grateful to you. Thank you to Lady Chief Justice uh, for her, not just for uh, her introductory remarks, but for her leadership support and reflections both today uh, but also beyond. Her remarks are always insightful and she continues to demonstrate a strong commitment to human rights and the rule of law for which we are all grateful and we are all beneficiaries. I would also like to mention two people, one I know is here because I can see her, um, Vicky Tennant who is the representative in London of the UNHCR but we also have we hope her colleague uh, Peter Fitzmaurice based in Yemen uh, they're both made in Belfast, both produced by Belfast, so welcome back. 
Uh, so I turn to Dr. Gillian Triggs, uh, Assistant High Commissioner for Protection with the UNHCR. Um, we're very fortunate indeed uh, that she's agreed to join us in Belfast and deliver our annual human rights lecture. She is a outstanding public international lawyer. She's had a number of appointments uh, in service to human rights and the refugee cause, including uh, as president of the Australian Human Rights Commission. Now, I can't give you all of her uh, a bio because we want to hear from her, but I am going to give you a little snapshot so you know just what we're dealing with here. Um, she oversees UNHCR's uh, protection work to support uh, in support of millions uh, of refugees, asylum seekers, those who've been forced, uh, forcibly displaced within their own country and who are stateless. She's a dual national of Britain and Australia. She's held a number of leadership roles, including as director of the British Institute of International and Comparative Law in London, chair of the UN uh, Independent Expert Panel of Inquiry uh, into Abuse of Office and Harassment, uh, and Dean of the Faculty of Law and Chalice Professor Emerita, I believe, uh, of International Law at the University of Sydney. It doesn't end there, I'm afraid. She has supported many not-for-profit uh, groups, including most recently as Chair of Justice Connect, uh, which uh, quite a few people in this room may be interested in. It connects 10,000 lawyers to provide pro bono advice to asylum seekers and others needing legal support. She's also just in passing the author of many books, papers in international law, including uh, and I mentioned these two specifically, International Law, Contemporary Principles and Practice and Speaking Up, um, both of which I've had the pleasure of reading. Uh, and as has already been mentioned, she was awarded in July 21 a Ruth Bader Ginsburg inaugural um, Medal of Honour in recognition of her role in the rule of law and, and gender equality. And when I read a, a bio like that, it does make me wonder how I've spent my time, <laughs> what I should have been doing uh, instead of what I've actually been doing. So all in all, um, I think you'll agree a long-term commitment to the realisation of rights for the most vulnerable in society, and that's also why we're here today. And she demonstrates, as have our two previous uh, uh, contributors, the true humanity in human rights at a time when it can feel elusive. Recent actions by the UK government, such as the Illegal Migration Act, the Rwanda Asylum Proposals, uh, the uh, Bibi Stockholm Barge, which sounds uh, deceptively friendly, uh, and the language being used, uh, most importantly, I think, in the public sphere, give us cause for real concern. We've highlighted in our annual human rights statement uh, many issues leading urgent attention, but they have yet to be addressed. And those that could be addressed in Northern Ireland clearly aren't being um, at the minute due to lack of a Northern Ireland executive. And the longer that goes on, I'm afraid, uh, we'll only see an escalation in uh, the, the, the gaps in, in inequalities and human rights violations, which we can all see. Unfortunately, we can walk out of this building and see them uh, this evening. The timing of this lecture is particularly pertinent. Um, Gillian will present uh, the title of the lecture, which I love, is Global Refugee Protection at Some New Thinking. Um, we don't half need some of that, so it's very welcome indeed. And I am delighted um, if you could all join me in welcoming Dr. Gillian Triggs to give our annual lecture. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chief uh, Commissioner. It's been a great pleasure to uh, renew our acquaintance uh, because our paths have crossed uh, in recent times. Thank you very much, um, Chief Justice. I know you've left a, a major Commonwealth conference, but I'm very honoured that you've, you've joined me. And if I may say so, you have uh, beautifully introduced what I'm about to talk about. You've raised some of the very, very critical issues. And thank you very much indeed to the Chair of the Bar. I can't resist saying it's wonderful to see so many women in these very senior positions, a great uh, and refreshing uh, thing to observe. So uh, distinguished uh, uh, guests and, and colleagues, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to, to join the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission and to speak about the plight of refugees as they seek international protection in this increasingly unstable geopolitical and polarised global environment. I'm, of course, very pleased to be here because Belfast is a city of sanctuary which welcomes and includes refugees as part of the community. And that is always a welcome sign for me and all my colleagues whenever we come to a city uh, to see these the banners and to know uh, that the local people stand by uh, refugees and understand their plight. 
But I've also uh, not only uh, longed to meet colleagues here at the Northern Ireland Commission, although I've met many of them um, over the years um, in, in, in Geneva and, and in Australia, I've always wanted to come here, uh, both in my current role, but of course as the, as the president of the Australian Human Rights Commission. Um, the national human rights bodies are increasingly important to the UN Refugee Agency. Um, of course, this commission is an A-status organi uh, organization within the UN system, and it's an independent body under the United Nations Paris principles. And that's, that's something to have achieved and to have maintained. Um, the commission is well-placed to advocate for the concrete implementation of human rights, but very importantly, to act as a bridge between the sovereign nation on one hand and civil society in another. It's a role that within the UN system, of course, we don't have. Um, and you can provide this uh, a measured, evidence-based and legally based uh, advocacy to the governments to which you are so much closer. Can I also recognise and thank the people of Northern Ireland for your commitment to refugees uh, generally, because this uh, region was the first in the United Kingdom to provide legal guardians for unaccompanied asylum seeker children. And the Chief Justice has mentioned children uh, as a particular area of concern and one real achievement I think it's a genuine achievement to hear uh, to provide a guardian for these children. It's enormously important and we're very pleased to see that. But also other examples of, of, um, of a compassionate response and providing alternatives that I'll come back to in a minute. But both Queen's and the University of Ulster um, are part of a growing number of academic institutions that offer scholarships to refugee um, students across this country. But as you will probably know, Northern Ireland uh, hosts 2,000 Ukrainians and over the last eight years has received some 1,900 refugees uh, from uh, the uh, resettlement program, mainly and very obviously uh, from Af Af Afghanistan and Syria, including some welcomed by the community sponsorship groups and they've been extremely successful. Well, what I'd like to do, if I may, is to use my time to do two things. First, to describe the problem. What are the legal and political uh, contexts in which UNHCR works to ensure protection and solution for refugees and to secure their rights meaningfully? But secondly, to, to, to consider the, the very challenging um, allegation that the refugee regime is no longer fit for purpose in providing durable solutions for people who've been forcibly displaced. Is, for example, normative refugee law capable of responding to the scale of movements today? What options can be explored to find those solutions? And that's why I was uh, coming up with the title for my third point, which is what refreshed and creative innovative thinking and solutions can we, can we work on together? And perhaps that's the operative word. Well, just like the Chief Justice, I, I want to begin with the fundamental principles, because this year we celebrate uh, the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Eleanor Roosevelt, as the chair of the drafting committee, fully understood the need to ensure in the post-war world that, that universal rights were for everybody and that we needed to respect the equal worth of each person. The Declaration and this is what is so fascinating in a way. It recognised then the crucial rights um, of refugees to seek and enjoy asylum from persecution and the right to a nationality. These were critically uh, critical points in, in recognising human rights in those uh, years after the Second World War. Um, the aim at that time was to find a definitive solution forever for the two million people or so who were still displaced in the, in the years after the war. But following the Universal Declaration, of course a non-binding document, we had an inspiration for the development of the 20th century body of treaty-based human rights obligations, which are accepted undeniably by most states. The, uh, following the Universal Declaration, of course, three years later, we had the, Universal, uh, the, the Refugee Convention itself which was to give legal status to the right to seek asylum in the Declaration and to um, give legal substance to, again, a point the Chief Justice has made, the prohibition on the reformant of people entitled to refugee status to 
uh, areas of persecution and violence. I'm sure you're all very familiar with all of that. The convention of which the United Kingdom was, of course, one of the lead uh, drafters was quite revolutionary for its time in guaranteeing refugees the widest possible exercise of fundamental rights and freedoms, adding economic, social and cultural rights, along with the rather more understood civil and political rights. This was well before uh, the uh, Convention on Economic and Social Rights, of course, was, was really agreed. It was revolutionary and it's very important to our work for reasons that perhaps will be clearer in a moment. But in these post-war years, there was a time of great optimism for the international rules-based peace uh, uh, environment. But the tragic reality is that since that time, the numbers of people forcibly displaced, whether within their own country, most typically, or across national boundaries, have continued to rise. Every year for the last 10 years, for example, the UN Refugee Agency has reported increased numbers, and every year the plight of those displaced becomes ever more desperate. There are now more than 110 million people forcibly displaced throughout the world, double the numbers reported even 10 years ago. 36 million would be our refugees. The greater number, 64 at least, are displaced in their own countries. Well, one point I wanted to make about UNHCR, although my role is, is protection and law and, and, and policy uh, to a very high degree, uh, what we're particularly notable for, and something I've really only learned since I've been in this position, is that the agency is essentially operational in emergency and crisis environments. We work uh, to a very uh, significant degree with the uh, NGO and civil society partners in 137 countries. We have, I'm reliably told, 580 field offices and operations and 20,000 staff uh, in border and conflict areas striving to meet the UN Secretary General's commitment that we would stay and deliver as politically neutral or impartial uh, UN humanitarian um, uh, agencies. But just one recent crisis, and one you'll be aware of, has been the devastating and unexpected impact of the conflict in Sudan on the civilian population. Just two or three years ago, with the High Commissioner, we were celebrating Sudan as a, as a poster child for what could be done with a peace process and to end civil war. As you know, the president got the Nobel Peace Prize. Now we have four million people displaced within the country itself, joining one or more than a million refugees already hosted by that country from South Sudan, and about a million have fled to neighbouring countries, Egypt, Chad, the Central African Republic and Ethiopia, uh, with their own problems, of course, but nonetheless, keeping their borders open and offering sanctuary to refugees from this um, evolving uh, civil war. The impact of conflict and violence as primary drivers of displacement is clear. Over two thirds of all refugees and others in need of international protection have fled from Afghanistan, Syria, Ukraine and Venezuela, forcing the fastest displacement of people since the Second World War. But then we, we have to see the wider context as well. There have been eight coups in Africa in three years, bringing yet further massive displacement. Refugee producing countries are also countries that receive refugees in a swirl of people seeking uh, basic protection. We have a million Rohingya who fled Myanmar and 6.3 million displaced in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Perhaps there are enough numbers, but I wanted to give you a sense of just some of the countries and the sheer dimension um, of, of, this, of, of, the, uh, of the movement of peoples. And uh, in the last two years, uh, 2021 and 2022, uh, the UN Refugee Agency has declared 78 new crises and emergencies in 44 countries. We've never seen anything like it. Uh, perhaps the word unprecedented is overused, but in this instance, it, it, is, it, 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 it is a truly a crisis protection uh, throughout the world. And, and as the Chief Justice has pointed out, um, between 40, 45% of refugees are children under 18. Um, and it's despairing to see them. Um, and in many conflicts, particularly most recently in my experience, Ukraine, those displaced, um, about 80% of them will be women and children. Um, and particularly, I notice 
uh, older people, people with disabilities, people um, who do not have credit cards to get on planes and get on trains, but they are the ones that are limping across the border in Poland or in Moldova um, in, in utter, utter despair. So the root causes of forced displacement are typically to be found in the very breaches of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that, were, that, that, were, that that declaration was designed to protect. Life, liberty, security, equality, protection from discrimination and arbitrary arrest, detentions arbitrarily, education, work, freedom of movement and nationality. So to respect those human rights is to address the root causes of refugee flight in the spirit uh, of leaving no one behind, the, the ambition uh, of the Secretary General. Well, in describing this situation, the numbers really are, are incomprehensible. And it's really only by telling the story that we can get some sense of, of how dire the situation is. And I was recently in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where my colleagues have been on the ground throughout and, and indeed have been for many years. And I saw the conditions of some of the 6.3 million displaced there. The conflict in the region of North Kivu around Goma and Beni has forced families from their homes and villages living in frankly appalling conditions with a metre or so of UNHCR plastic with a few bamboo sticks and, the, and that camp goes as far as the eyes can see. They are welcomed by a generous but poor host community um, and they continue to live in fear of violence um, that makes their lives um, almost impossible to, to think of in terms of the future. The violence continues daily, weekly, and just a few days ago in Ituri province, uh, the, at least 45 people were killed by a non-government armed group, including women and children, 12 of them burned alive in their own mud huts. Um, the protection needs for just that uh, region alone are funded to less than 30%, uh, mirroring the dire financial constraints upon UNHCR's work uh, and with our partners in the region. Well, this is a very grim picture, but it is lightened by examples of solidarity, inclusion and compassion. Despite these numbers, um, many and indeed now most countries keep their borders open to those in need of international protection. That is, that is a significant achievement for that normative right of access to asylum and we're very pleased to, to recognise it. Uh, examples include, and, and, and you'll be all particularly uh, familiar with this, the triggering of the Temporary Protection Directive by Europe in response to the war in Ukraine uh, and the grant of, for example, prima facie status by the Central African Republic to the very recent arrivals from South Sudan. You'll be aware also of the work that that the, the protection provided by Bangladesh to the Rohingya and Turkey uh, to millions um, of, uh, of Syrian refugees for the last 11 or 12 years, bringing uh, considerable burdens to those, to those countries and making a point that, that is very relevant to our work at UNHCR and that is the protracted nature of conflicts. They used to be relatively, they were over fairly quickly, you'd have a peace agreement and you could move on. Now we're dealing with with, um, with Afghanistan, more than 40 years, with Syria, 12 years, uh, Myanmar, again, apparently irresolvable. We hope that one day they will be resolved. But compounding the conflict-driven displacement that I have emphasised is uh, our other elements, and, and one of them the Chief Justice has raised, and that is climate change. Um, we're seeing drought in Somalia, which has led to conflict, which has led to people um, just a few months ago leaving two or 3,000 a day into... Uh, um, very isolated areas of Ethiopia, a country struggling itself. Uh, the war in Ukraine has caused food security globally, but most particularly in Africa. The biggest point that the women in, in uh, North uh, Kivu in Congo uh, talked to me about uh, was not their security because they were now relatively safe, but still subject to armed groups, but um, gender-based violence uh, spiking child protection needs, uh, various elements that they could have talked to me about, but the one they talked to me about was food insecurity. They don't have any food even for that evening. It was really despairing to, 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 to talk to these families, particularly the women whose lives in that culture have been built around protecting, caring for the family and cooking a meal at night. 
Um, but the consequences are huge. And now we see uh, earthquakes in northwest Syria and Turkey, floods in Pakistan, and in the last few days, of course, uh, floods in, in Libya. And they prompt the very question that the Chief Justice has asked, and that is, how are we going to respond as, as lawyers, as human rights um, protectors, uh, as so many of you are in this room, how are we going to respond? Um, uh, a, a critical question is, can the international legal system and human rights provide protection for people who are fleeing from the impacts of, of, com of, of climate change? Uh, might some of them, uh, in some circumstances, be, as is in the popular pilots at least, climate refugees? And these are things that I think we as lawyers need to be willing to address. Difficult legal questions, um, but ones that I think we have to use our expertise to deal with. And a fact that suggests um, many more movements of peoples as a consequence of climate change is the World Bank's uh, report this year, the World Development Report, uh, that 40% of the world's population, 3.5 billion people, live in places vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. We expect to see these numbers increase. So although I have been quite uh, determined to emphasize the point that most displacement is, com is driven by conflict, we will expect to see at least more conflict-related displacements as a consequence of climate change. We will have to see. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the problem. But what about the legal challenges? Um, and I've mentioned that there are perceptions driven at the political level in particular that the asylum system is broken and it can no longer provide adequate protection. That reform, perhaps of the Refugee Convention itself, is needed, but that maybe we need a new protocol for climate-driven displacement. I suggest we really need to listen very carefully to the concerns of governments and to citizens and communities, because some of the uh, challenges are not only common, but they are, are in many cases justifiable. And I'll just mention a few of them, but well, I'm sure you'll be well aware of these. Legal and administrative processes are slow and cumbersome, and the backlog of applications remain unresolved for many, many years, leaving people in legal twilight zones. Refugees wait very often globally without work rights or access to education and health care. They cannot be self-sufficient. They're totally dependent on humanitarian aid uh, and they're unable to use their skills and talents and energy and vibrancy to benefit their host communities. Where a country does provide a fair due process system for considering their claim as a refugee and where an applicant for asylum is found not to be in need of international protection, it's close to impossible to return them to their country of origin. Many states will not permit forced returns of their own citizens and bilateral agreements for returns either do not exist or don't work. Where returns are possible, few resources are available to ensure the safety of a returnee and their integration back into their society. Returns are often uh, to the same conditions of poverty, inequality and discrimination that led to the movement in the first place. Adding to the complexity is the rising phenomenon of mixed movements of peoples, comprising people fleeing war and conflict and persecution as I've described, but also, and typically younger men, seeking opportunities for work and to build a meaningful future for themselves and their families. While migrants and refugees have different legal status, their protection needs are often similar and each is entitled to basic human rights. All these complexities and impediments to an effective asylum system have prompted extreme responses by governments, some of them the most powerful and important supporters for the refugee system in the first place. And that is, of course, a great concern to us at the UN Refugee Agency. Um, the most obvious uh, um, uh, impact and prompt, uh, prompted in, impact from governments has been the denial of entry at borders in making a claim for asylum. We saw, of course, the closing of borders in, for COVID, but some countries have taken op and the opportunity to continue those border closures and deny that fundamental principle deriving from the declaration, of course, as, uh, as we have both said, uh, from the Declaration of, of Human Rights. But we also see now um, the pushbacks both at land borders and sea frontiers, uh, to say nothing, of course, of the, of the walls, of the trenches, of the barbed wire, uh, the barriers, the very things we hoped we would never see after 
um, the fall, of course, of the Berlin Wall. We've seen also extraordinarily a refusal or reluctance to rescue people at sea seeking protection, contrary not to recent uh, human rights law or refugee law, but ancient maritime law, the duty to rescue ships in distress. And not only that, but where they have been rescued, a refusal to disembark, leaving ships floating around the Andaman Sea or the Bay of Biscay seeking any country willing to allow them to disembark. Um, all of this, of course, amounts to the, a violation of that fundamental principle, the non-derogable principle of international law, uh, the uh, prohibition of reformant to, to danger. We've also seen the adoption of deterrent policies such as detention, particularly of children, is, is worrying because the core principle, I'm sure as you all know, is that you do not detain children except maybe uh, in reception centres for periods of time to help them. A few countries also have tried to shift the responsibility for refugees and asylum seekers, typically to poorer distant countries, a form of externalisation which denies territorial access to asylum, contrary to international law. Um, the Chief Justice has mentioned that I'm a dual national. I'm a, I'm a national of both of those countries that have produced some of the worst examples of externalisation. So I'm not quite sure where I stand on this, but um, Australia, of course, has done this and indeed is persisting in doing it with a recent arrival of a boat taking people to Nauru. But the, you'll know that I want to get to, of course, the UK's Illegal Migration Act. Um, it is an important case in point. It amounts to a ban on seeking asylum in the United Kingdom for all but a very few refugees with inadequate safeguards to ensure protection of their rights and with no uh, examination of individual protection needs, a core part of the practice of, of refugee law. Most asylum seekers are uh, uh, by duty to be removed by the minister to a third country, including, of course, Rwanda, with which the asylum seeker may or may not have any prior connection and very often will not have any cultural or language connection and no guarantee that they'll be able to access protection there in line with international standards. I think you'll be familiar with the, our view uh, that this is a clear breach of the Refugee Convention and a measure that runs counter to the principle of international responsibility upon which the Refugee Convention is based. Some states have also adopted the idea of forced returns to a safe third country of transit where returns to the country of origin is not possible. So in short, many of, if not most, of the fundamental principles of refugee law and of course of international human rights law are now under threat. Uh, they're under threat normatively by countries that have always supported and indeed created those principles. And that is deeply worrying. In addition to the challenges, is the, uh, the ones that I've outlined, is the practical fact that 75% of the burden of hosting refugees typically lies with low to middle income countries, developing countries, in the neighbourhood of the conflict. That's where most of the millions are, either within the country or in the neighbourhood. They are not coming across the Mediterranean or the English Channel. A few obviously are. Most Afghans are hosted by Pakistan and Iran. About 8 million, not half of them registered. Somalis being protected by Kenya and Ethiopia, Syrians by Turkey, Jordan and Lebanon. Indeed, it's the local communities and authorities that step up to help, adding to local needs where their, 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 host, communi their, their host community has very significant needs. And coincidentally, the most climate impact countries are also the countries of source and welcome. It's troubling that responsibility for refugees is not shared and when countries further away from crisis zones receive many fewer refugees, they are seen to be stepping away from their responsibilities, sending a very damaging signal that has the potential to undermine the basis of the international regime for protection. Well, these are the challenges, but what are the options for solutions? At UNHCR, we're really quite good, I think my colleagues will agree, we're quite good at describing the problem. We have data, we have analysis, uh, but it's not enough. We need to find durable solutions, and that is one of the mandate obligations of this, of this UN uh, agency. And there are some traditional solutions for people who are forcibly displaced, and I'll just go through them very, very briefly. The first is voluntary returns to the country of origin, where it's safe and dignified to do so. The second 
are opportunities for resettlement, family reunion, labour mobility, education and community sponsorship, the so-called regular or safe pathways. And the third is local integration in the host country. Well, I wanted to say something about the first of them, voluntary returns. We know that almost all refugees, wherever they are in the world, and indeed internally displaced people, truly hope to return to their towns and their villages, their land and their communities. Most don't want to do so unless the conditions are safe and conducive to rebuilding their lives. In Syria, for example, on the border, I've been, uh, sorry, not uh, Syria, uh, from Syria, in uh, Jordan, visiting camps that have been there for 10 or 11 years in poor conditions, although the country is doing what it can to, to help these people. The, the, the camps are there in, literally in the desert. And I spoke to, to, to families and said, UNHCR could help you with the paperwork. Uh, we can physically help you get across the border area to deal with the, all the formalities that are necessary. If you want to return to your villages in Syria, we will help you. And the response is always, we want to go back, we long to go back to our homeland, to our culture, our poetry, our, 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 uh, the world we know and our villages. But although we've been here in 10 years, we adamantly refuse to go because we know how dangerous it is for us. And that, that is really the problem. They won't go back where there's continued conflict, political instability, threats from non-government armed groups, particularly in Africa, and particularly the lack of access to health clinics, social support, few opportunities for work, and in the Syria case, of course, exposure to uh, conscription. So that a, a, a woman I speak to and say, would you take your family back? She said, I'd like to go back to my village, but my son will be immediately conscripted into one side or the other of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the conflict. But above all, trust must be rebuilt for returns and national protection restored. It's very, very difficult to achieve returns. We, some have returned to their place of origin um, in 2022, 5.7. Um, and we, we see some opportunities and we're working very hard on area-based um, uh, work to rebuild clinics, to get schools started, to see if we can encourage private sectors to invest in, in jobs. And that will enable in some safe areas for families to be returned. But the truth is the numbers are tiny. Um, and and that, is, that is perhaps the key point I want to make. We have facilitated voluntary repatriation, for example, of 207,000 Burundian refugees from Tanzania. That's been a, a modest success. Burundi is now relatively safe. There are opportunities and they are returning. We can do it. But in terms of the scale of the problem, it's a very, very tiny number that are able to return from most of the conflicts that we're dealing with. Afghanistan will be, will be a very good example of that. Uh, the second traditional approach is, is to be found in the, in the regular pathways. And one that you will know um, uh, well, of course, is, um, is resettlement. Uh, we have seen an improvement in resettlement numbers. They vanished to almost a um, disappearing point uh, in, uh, as, uh, under COVID for obvious reasons. But the, the program is now being built up. I should say with the very, very significant support of the United States, its target this year is 120,000 uh, with particular, particular categories for the Rohingya. Um, but one of the ironies uh, of this uh, problem of the Rohingya, even with the generosity of the United States in focusing on a return uh, resettlement program for them, is that the birth rate in Cox's Bazaar of Rohingya um, massively uh, outpaces any resettlement program that could possibly be developed. So it, it, we're not solving the problem. And I think that really is my core point, uh, that um, resettlement is for fewer than 1% of refugees ne in need of, in, uh, of resettlement. Um, but again, I repeat how pleased we are that we're seeing resettlement to this country. And um, we hope that that can, uh, can, can, in, uh, can increase. Family reunification is probably one of the most effective and probably less political forms of pathways. Uh, most people understand family reunions and it's easier to do and we expect to see um, uh, some, some higher numbers. Labour mobility as a safe pathway is uh, also proving to be um, gathering, uh, gathering uh, uh, commitment from many countries around the world. I find I have to be uh, a little diplomatic when I go to Japan or North Korea or parts of Europe to say, well, uh, you have ageing communities 
Why do we not turn this discussion around and talk about refugees and migrants as providing the labour you need in childcare centres, in, 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 um, in, in care for the aged, for uh, agriculture and construction work, uh, hospitality? Uh, it's true for Europe. It's true in Italy, as the president uh, uh, is to thoroughly understood. So we're seeing a little change in that, in that discussion, because if we can provide safe labour pathways, then we can provide some solutions. But at the moment, it's very small. The last one, inclusion, I think is one that uh, is, the is, and it's hard to say, uh, to host countries. This is the real solution at the moment for almost all refugees. They will stay where they are because they can't return. So the burden lies on, on those, as I said earlier, typically lower, uh, lower income countries. And that is why uh, we need to find more funding to support those host countries until it's possible for returns. And that, of course, includes um, uh, the, the major conflicts. One of the ironies, perhaps, uh, or the consequences of the war in Ukraine is that a great deal of the funding has gone to Ukraine, which means that the Congo, Burkina Faso, Mali, um, uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, uh, etc., uh, they are all seriously underfunded because the attention has moved to the massive war on the, on the, on, on, in Europe. So there are consequences that are much deeper than one might imagine. So let me get to my, the point. The thing I really want to talk about and to hear some of your thoughts about is um, what's some new thinking? We can't keep describing the problem. We can't keep bemoaning the lack of resources. We cannot keep... Um, every year describing how many more millions as though this was some sort of successful target that we're striving to reach. We have to think differently and holistically to look at root causes and to assure uh, that we can find some pathways that recognise the genuine concerns of states on the grounds that I've listed, but also, of course, that security is often uppermost. If I speak to a minister in Africa in particular, they'll always begin by telling me about their security problems and they're totally genuine. They're quite right. Uh, so we have to find a way of supporting those governments while also recognising that they need to secure their borders and they need to manage security. So what are we, what are we doing at the UN Refugee Agency to try to turn this around? One is something that we haven't said a lot in the public arena about um, but I think it's been uh, very exciting, certainly for me and my colleagues in the legal and policy, uh, the Division of International Protection that I'm uh, responsible for. And that is we've formed collaborations with the development actors, but most particularly the development banks, the international financial institutions, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, um, and the regional and national development agencies, and of course with the private sector. What we're hoping to do is by working with those development agencies, we can facilitate the release of funds to host countries and countries of origins to address root causes to displacement through development, through um, investing in, in job creation or addressing the problems of poverty and inequality, housing, education and services, because it's a lack of those services and opportunities that leads to the movement of mixed groups, whether they're migrants or refugees, and depending on the circumstances. We know that if people have livelihoods, then they can rise to their potential, they can contribute to their communities, uh, and they can stabilise in the area rather than moving on. Um, I'll, I'll just give you a couple of examples, but one is the work with the World Bank. What we've done as lawyers is to give a, a legally accurate, I hope, description of a particular country. Let's take Kenya uh, or Rwanda or Bangladesh, describing what they do in terms of human rights, the extent to which they comply, what their refugee regime is. And then we have to, in a sense, certify to the World Bank that that country is, has a sufficient regulatory environment consistent with human rights to warrant either concessional loans, which we don't really want to see so much of, but grants 
to those countries to help support the governments and to get money into not only refugees but the host communities dealing with that problem of inclusion. And we've only we've been doing this for the last three and a half years. It's been a learning exercise for us because we've not worked with, with major bodies like the World Banks and regional banks. But it's true to say that through this work, uh, many billions of dollars have been f released by the World Bank to about 26 countries. And we're starting to see some of the outcomes of, ben of benefit to those host communities and refugees. It's non-transactional from our point of view. We, there's no money changes hands as far as we're concerned. But we can attest to the fact that we've played a role in enabling those institutions to meet the director's needs for, for releasing funds. And, and I should say it's 23 refugee hosting countries that are currently receiving funds. Uh, and it's developing now um, it, it, with, the, with the regional groups. Um, and one example of that is the International Finance Corporation that um, is a, an arm of the World Bank. And that is now working in Kakuma in Kenya, which has been one of, I think, more than 30 years as a, as a refugee camp. Once you establish a camp, refugees become dependent and they receive aid and they keep on receiving aid. They can't work and they can't contribute to the community. And that remains unchanged. So we have an out of camp policy. But now the International Finance Corporation is moving in with its bank managers and its micro lending and its, its various services to work with the community so that it's no longer a camp but will be a city under a new uh, project uh, by, by the government of Kenya uh, that will benefit and work collaboratively on entrepreneurial uh, ideas with the local community. Now, it's only just started, but I think it's one of the most exciting ways of breaking down these, these camps. Another is when I was in Croatia, I was uh, lucky to go through uh, the factory at uh, IKEA. And IKEA has a policy of investing in countries like this, which is really a transit country, a rather undignified position for a country uh, such as Croatia or Bosnia-Herzegovina on their way to Austria and Europe. Not a, not a good situation, but nonetheless, the government has decided to encourage the private sector to invest, to create jobs. And IKEA is doing that in that country and in many other parts of the world. And to, to be there and to see that it's actually refugees moving around those crates of, of furniture yet to be built, um, it, it's, a, it's a remarkable thing. And they are then trained to go out into the community and work in other areas, or they stay as loyal people with IKEA, but they're just examples. Um, but that's one area, and I hope that we can get more information. We've, got, um, we've just issued a report on 15 case studies showing how that release of funds through grants is helping governments meet, uh, meet the needs. The other, and, and I think a very exciting initiative, is the whole of journey approach. In other words, yes, development investment to deal with root causes, but that's not always possible. Um, people move along well-trodden routes where they, they are dangerous, they are vulnerable to, um, to traffickers, to smugglers, to gang, criminal gangs, to sexual abuse, and um, sadly, uh, sexual abuse of children and the, and the uh, trafficking of children. It's all real. Uh, it, it, it's astonishing, but it's real. How do we stop that? And what we're trying to do now is to work in a whole of society way with, with mayors, local governments, with faith-based groups, refugee-led organisations, small NGOs, parliamentarians, uh, and the legal profession that provide a great deal of pro bono work um, to try to ensure that people have information along those routes. Um, so that we, I, I, I'm sure you can think of them, but Mali to Niger, Libya to Tunisia and across the Mediterranean to Europe, Italy, etc. Uh, from the Atlantic coast up the, to, the, to the Canary Islands and Spain, Bangladesh and Myanmar to Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, Turkey and Greece to, towards Western Europe and through Central Europe to Western Europe and other, and, and other routes. Let us understand those routes to build connections between mayor and mayors and local governments as people move, and they do. I mean, if you've been to these countries, you can literally see people walking along the streets, along the, uh, along the main roads, moving to the next, the next city, the next local town, where they will need food and water and medical care, and, uh, but they keep moving. Um, it's a tragic sight. Uh, and if they're pushed back at the border, they come back again and do the same thing over and over and over again. We need to stop that and we need to do it in, 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 in some interesting ways. And one is, some of you may be aware of the blue dot um, centres that were set up to deal with people moving from Ukraine across into Europe. 
in a single place, and it can be at a railway station, a local clinic, at a town hall, um, even a local football field and, and, and um, facilities. But you have there somebody who can advise people on the mood, move, uh, what, there are, what, there, what the potential is. Could they possibly get refugee status? If so, perhaps they could be guided into a fast track process and we'd then possibly find resettlement positions. Um, would others never, never really be a refugee as a matter of law, but they have humanitarian needs and of course human rights. Uh, can we find an opportunity for them through family reunion, through education, through um, stabilisation in a, in a transit country where there might be work for them? Um, but also to give them accurate information and advice so that they do not fall into the hands of traffickers and people smugglers. Um, now, I don't want to be Pollyanna about this. Um, this is not going to be easy by any stretch of the imagination. But we saw it work very well with the, blue, the 39 blue dot centres that were set up throughout Europe, but of course in Ukraine itself. We think the idea can be translated. Um, and one area where this is actually starting to work is in the, United, uh, is in, in the Americas. If you think all of that transit route from Haiti, um, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, Mexico to the United States border, where so many, of course, have gone to really face a wall and, in effect, a denial of access to asylum, despite the fact, as I should point out, that the United States is taking many, many uh, tens of thousands of refugees through various other mechanisms. Um, so what we, what we, what the, what's happening in the Americas with Guatemala, uh, 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 Costa Rica, uh, Ecuador and Mexico is to set up what are called safe mobility programs. And that is they could be movable, but for the moment will be in one place. Um, centres, not unlike the blue dot idea, where you could have a government employment agency, you could have a child protection group, somebody skilled with gender-based violence, uh, somebody who could give a quick estimate a fast and fair system of triaging people into a refugee stream, but triaging people who are essentially economic migrants into areas where they're possibly into a labour mobility programme or into a local community resettlement programme, but to give them accurate information and to identify their needs quickly. Older people with terrible medical needs and, and um, insecurity, uh, psychological problems, traumatised, pick it up and get them referred to the right people. So we can see real potential with this idea. Um, but can I be absolutely crystal clear? A whole of journey approach, which we think is, is, go, is an exciting idea, is not to be adopted at the expense of the right to territorial access to asylum. The whole of journey approach is a, is a package idea. It's not for cherry picking. It would help to protect territorial uh, access to asylum, but also ensuring safe pathways to protection for both refugees and migrants and to encourage the development banks and private sector to support governments and local authorities, in turn, to support those people on the move and to advance their own citizens. Well, the third new thinking um, that I, I, I hope you're familiar with is that very different experiment in, not law, but in commitments, which is the Global Compact on Refugees. You'll remember the New York Declaration of 2017. That led to the Global Compact on Migration and the Global Compact on, on Refugees. Um, the, the, the Global Compact on Refugees was affirmed in the General Assembly uh, in 2018 and 181 countries agreed to the fundamental principles. And there are two principles. One is that all countries will agree to share equitably the burdens and responsibilities for refugees. I don't really like the word burdens, but that is in the compact. I like to think of refugees as people who can contribute, but we know that they do place huge burdens on the hosting countries. Um, but the second principle, and one that is very important, is that this is no longer only the responsibility of sovereign nations, but is the responsibility of the entire international community. And that brings me back to some of the ideas I've already been exploring, the importance of civil society and NGOs, the private sector, philanthropists, mayors, city, city groups, faith-based groups. Faith-based groups, they don't, we, we saw this very much in COVID, they don't go away when the project funding stops. Faith groups remain in those communities and they remain first responders, and they're very, very important to building this notion of a whole of society, but also parliamentarians, scholars, 
Uh, the legal profession has been enormously important in this area. And I should have mentioned this first, the voices of refugees themselves um, as they uh, uh, develop the refugee-led groups. Critically, then, the compact is not a legal agreement. It builds on refugee law, but it's not something that can be enforced in the domestic courts um, or anywhere else, for that matter. It's an aspiration, but it's one that I think drives our strategy at the UN Refugee Agency, how to build that international community and how to give real meaning to the principle of equitable sharing of responsibility. It's not just words on a page because there's a mechanism for doing it. And that is through the Global Refugee Forum. We had the first in December 2019. And at that forum, pledges were made by host countries, countries of origin, uh, donor countries, by faith groups and parliamentarians and scholars. Um, we had 1,400 pledges to share the burden equitably. And the High Commissioner very wisely at that time, he being much more experienced uh, on the ground at least with refugees, said in his ending speech, this is the makings of a success. And I thought, oh, surely it's going to be more than that. But he was very wise because within weeks of the forum, we had COVID and then we've had the rise of conflict uh, that I've already described. In December this year, we have the second Global Refugee Forum four years later to see whether the mechanism of pledging is real. You can make a pledge, it's aspirational, it's not legal, it can't be enforced in any practical way. Is it going to be a mechanism that will really deliver results? Will it show that by burden sharing, responsibility sharing globally, we can start to address this problem? And I, it's one of my responsibilities at, 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 the, at the agency. We're not there yet. And it, we have disappointing elements, but we also have a lot to show for it. And we've learned a lot. And one is that it's one thing to make for a single country to make a pledge, but many of those countries needed support in order to implement the pledge. And, and that's not been as successful as we would like. I think about a third of the pledges have been met. Now, we were never going to conquer the world or this problem in four years. I think we've come down the pathway. We're on the way. What is remarkable in this, because I did begun, begin by saying what a divided geopolitical world we're in, the reality, and I can attest to this, um, our member countries are solidly behind the principles of the compact. That hasn't really diminished. But there's no doubt at all that African countries, by way of example, but most, most critically, are saying to us, you know, the burden is not yet being shared. What more are you going to do? So I think we'll have some good stories to tell at the end of this year, but we won't be all the way there. Uh, one of the good stories is, of course, the legal profession. I think the first pledge was something like 65,000 pro bono hours of support for refugees and asylum seekers. Um, the delivered uh, play, uh, reality was 145,000 hours of pro bono work actually provided. And it's been remarkable and I'm very proud of my own profession because I think it is so important that we use the legal advice and the legal techniques in order to, to, to give effect to these, these pledges. Um, so I, I think that we've, we've come a long way. It will be evidence-based, it's not anecdotal. We have data, we have OECD development funding data, we've got data for uh, through our dashboards and please do look it up if you're interested in the detail but I think we we are really going to be able to achieve some outcomes about with a, a considerable distance to go uh, but I would like to uh, acknowledge um, that the United Kingdom has been very engaged in one of the pledges which is a mega pledge for education um, and I had the uh, honor of going to a Wilton Park conference a few months ago with them um, with Vicky, our, our uh, representative here in the United Kingdom. And I think there is a genuine um, attempt through the government to bring together its education experts and to build a global coalition to support education for these children. So I think that's very positive and we want to build those ideas of working together because alone we will never resolve this, this rising problem. So can I finish uh, by coming back to the importance of national human rights institutions. I believe there are now 120 of them worldwide. I know what a crucial role they can play because they have that straight line, I believe, to the government. You can talk to the ministers, you can go and explain what's needed. Not always easy, it's not always, they don't always want to hear what you have to say, 
but most will. And I think you can influence the law and practice on the ground. And, and for that reason, the national human rights bodies, and particularly of Northern Ireland, uh, are very important partners for us. So thank you all. I'm sure I've spoken rather longer than I should have, but nonetheless, thank you for your patience. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. So we've got a little bit of time for a couple of questions, but I do hope you'll join us for a bit of a reception. Um, I can see it's, it's almost ready uh, and we'll all be hanging around so you can ask us additional questions. Um, but can I invite a question from the floor? Thank you. My name's Liz Griffith and I work at the Law Centre here in Belfast. I um, want to comment on the, the Ukraine scheme and the implementation of the Ukraine scheme here in Northern Ireland has been really effective. Um, the, the speed and depth of the Northern Ireland Government Department's response has been quite um, amazing. But what I would say for every, um, there have been about two and a half thousand Ukrainians arrived through that scheme and for every Ukrainian who has been welcomed and has obtained status, there is at least one asylum seeker who's languishing in the asylum system. Uh, you spoke about the, the, the legal twilight, you know, so people are stuck in that system. And I wondered what advice do you have for civil society organizations like the Law Center? How do we hold government to account and remind them that their duties are to all refugees it's, you know, can't just focus on the Ukrainians. And, you know, particularly in the context that a lot of the refugee rights are not immediately enforceable in international laws, but how do we um, demand and hold them to account on their duties? Thank you. Uh, no. <laughs> That one first? Well, very, very quickly, of course, that, that is something we're very worried about. Not only are you describing the current situation, but we're deeply concerned about the future under the new legislation. Because the thousands, tens of thousands of people will be in a legal limbo um, and they will not have a position one way because they, they can't get a, a, um, a, a judicial or administrative review of their claim to asylum. Um, but they can't be returned. So what is going to happen to them? And will they genuinely, will they be detained? We don't know. Um, we see that as one of the biggest problems. And what we feel is that there's, there's advocacy. And I know my colleagues are engaged in advocacy and I've been myself for bilateral protection meetings with, uh, with the minister, um, but, which I think were, were, were fruitful because there are opportunities within the act that allow for discretions, which should be exercised by reference to international law. And we hope that there are some opportunities there. Um, but I can't, um, you, you describe, again, it's describing the problem, what do we do about it? In my former role with the Australian Human Rights Commission, we would try to use the principles against arbitrary detention. And we would simply say detention becomes arbitrary and arbitrariness is unacceptable under the fundamental principles of the common law, even if you don't have legislation on the fact. So I, I think one of the, not a, I've mentioned pro bono law, but one of the critical values of, of national human rights bodies, but the legal profession generally, is the ability to bring litigation and try, test these. How long can you pe keep people in detention uh, is, becomes an arbitrary detention and contrary to everything we know about in the common law system. So good luck and thank you for your work. Ursula, do you want to? Uh, can I ask a question in relation to uh, addressing the gender-based impact of the application of um, refugee law? And I'm particularly wondering where you see the opportunities in, in law for addressing that and where you see the opportunities through the Global Compact for addressing the gender-based impact of displacement. Well, thank you. And, and I, I think what, that's one area where, I, where our donors are pushing us hard on this um, because gender-based violence is a, is, a, is a huge problem in every area of movement and com particularly in conflict, it's women and children who, who suffer. 
um, and and it's and it's genuine. It, it's slavery. It's it's selling children into into marriage. It's it's uh, trafficking. Uh, but the rape. Uh, when I was in um, Beni in uh, North Kivu province in Congo, um, just in that little area, 130 brothels have been set up. And everybody I was talking to was a male mayor of a, of, of a village or, or the local province. And they would all say this was terrible, that they would do nothing whatever to protect those women. They were doing it because they needed food. Um, so, but that's an extreme situation. But the level of sexual violence against women and children on these dangerous routes or in camps is huge. Um, so again, I'm describing the problem. Our donors um, and, and Europeans, the United Kingdom, the United States, um, are really urging us to, to say, we give you funding for gender-based violence. What are you doing with it? And what, what are the impacts and outcomes? I haven't had time to talk about trends, but that's one of the important trends that we have to rise to with the UNHCR. We have to show what the value for money. That we're in a new world. We, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, we didn't have to do this. Now we do. Um, and, but gender-based violence is one of those areas. Um, I think we have, need to give it more visibility. Um, it's true, of course, outside the refugee area, but I mean, this is a, this is a particularly um, deep problem. Uh, but I think we all need to, to get the facts right and to give it much more visibility and to talk about it. Uh, but, it but it's not something you, you, can, you can provide a plastic sheeting, water, pots and pans, mosquito nets, and even food. Um, but to deal with gender-based violence, it's huge cultural change, it's education, it's all sorts of things uh, that are much more difficult and much more expensive in many respects to deliver. So I think we need to work and talk about this much more and get it, get it, uh, get the experts to help more. So I'm, we're going to take one. This gentleman on the end was the first. Um, the, 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 this, uh, the, this gentleman here was the one who had his hand up first, if, if I may. No, no, behind. I had my hand up first, so I'll take advantage of the opportunity. Thank you very much, Commissioner, for your very cogent talk. My name is Frank Costello. I'm interested citizen, but I work with my colleague Stafford here on empowerment economically for disadvantaged children locally. But with respect to food security, you just mentioned in terms of women and brothels, but with respect to the wider issue you alluded to, the effect of food in terms of displacement, certainly, and sadly the countries as well having the issue of food, but it's also a human right codified for a long time and very difficult to grapple with. And well before the Ukraine crisis, the issue of weaponization of food was well an apparent reality. But in terms of what can be done more on dealing with the issue of food and connecting it to all the things you're talking about, and sadly, in the case of development or developed nations on their aid budgets, and the UK has been stellar in many respects. You're talking about the rights of women, but the UK government also in terms of the foreign aid budget, part of it being diverted to deal in a malign way with refugee issues and not in a, 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 a positive way insofar as the Rwanda plan. That's, that's apparently been going on in that case, but not unique to, to what the United Kingdom government's doing. But what can be done more to focus on, on the issue of food security, which is very much tied to the question of, of human rights and the refugee crisis? Oh, you're, you're right. And I think that that's one of the, um, the challenges within the UN system, because so much of what we do is interlinked. And yet we have perhaps siloed agencies that deal with these issues. But I think there's a much better understanding now within the UN system and with civil society of the interlinked nature of all of these things. Um, but the, the sad truth is that the World Food Programme has a significantly reduced budget. And in major areas of, of emergency and crisis, those uh, food budgets are being reduced by significant percentages, uh, which again it creates a, a problem for us not only, of course, obviously for the people who are in food insecure areas or starving, uh, but of course, how do we make the argument in December this year that there's been burden sharing when we don't have enough food? Um, when vaccines, of course, uh, went to, I think, uh, less, fewer than 4% to, to Africa in the first uh, couple of years of the COVID crisis. And, I mean, these are real uh, major issues that we have to resolve. I think, uh, if I can say so on behalf of the Secretary General, he's doing everything he can to have a whole of UN approach 
and underpinning that whole of UN approach is um, is a human right is is are, are the human rights principles um, and and a protection centered approach. But um, but we have to we have to get these messages into a much wider public, and we do use a lot of cliches. We all not cliches, but UN language. We have to communicate better, and we have to give greater visibility to the horror of these problems. Um, if I can just say one thing that really 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 drove the point home to me, um, I went with my colleagues uh, to um, the civil strife, uh, of course, in Cabo Delgado in Mozambique, and. Um, it, dealing again largely with women and children in a muddy field in a safe area, uh, fleeing horrific um, attacks by non-armed groups, Al-Shabaab to a significant degree, whole villages being burnt and, and children being machetes. They'd fled to this particular area. And again, what they needed more than anything else was food. Um, I went in an armoured UN car and a, a convoy of six plus uh, men on both sides in trucks with guns at the behest of the government. It was the only way we could be sure of being safe in that area. And of course, the safety of the people there was, well, of course, even more at risk. Um, but we, we did what we could with the, with the World Food Programme uh, to try to increase the food that they were receiving. They hadn't had any food left with them for the previous four months. They were literally starving. Um, but after that mission, and this is a bit of a personal story, if you'll excuse it, but after that mission, we drove back to Maputo. I got on a plane, and within six hours, I was in Paris. And it, it's shocking to me that we can have this uh, invisible war uh, with, with deep historical and religious and resource reasons, uh, but this happening with a million people displaced and the rest of the world knows almost nothing about it, but it's only a six hours flight, uh, direct flight into Paris, uh, where the world is a very different place uh, and so well resourced. So, but you're right. It, human rights lie at the, core, at the core of all of these issues. And I think uh, the UN, of course, promotes that understanding. That, but in order to implement it, uh, you need uh, implementation within domestic systems and you need funding for these great programs like the World Food Program and the World Health Organization, um, UNICEF, um, and many others. Thank you very much indeed. So I think there really is one, one left, ju ju just one, I'm afraid. I have to bring it to a close. Um, otherwise, you won't share our hospitality at all. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know the microphone. Can you hear me? Uh, my name is Suleiman Abdullahi. I work with the Refugees and Asylum Secrecy in Northern Ireland. Um, from Somalia originally, so you mentioned Somalia. Um, one particular th issue I want to raise and the, to the UNHCR to see uh, the country of origin, for example, the Home Office, the objective or the information they're using is very outdated. For example, in northern Somalia, there is a uh, like war, civil war almost out of war. And then last year in Somalia, there the over 43,000 uh, people died due to the conflict and the food insecurity and the people who are in a drought. And one particular case I wanted to bring to attention was there was a gentleman, a case where uh, someone, a uh, man from Somalia seek an asylum in the UK in 2003. And in being in limbo since 2018, uh, dead in Belfast's uh, Royal Hospital. And 17 years after still was have, have, stateless and then also uh, the, the court here, the tribunal here, granted him asylum after he passed away. So the cases, and now, are multiple cases of young men flee from Al-Shabaab in Northern Ireland. Almost 40 young men was refused last couple of weeks, and they're based in Belfast. So how can we avoid those young men to become the man who passed away in 2018? Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I'll only I, because I know we need to uh, we need to stop. But uh, I think uh, you do raise a point that I didn't have time to talk about. But that is the the, the scourge of statelessness. That when people leave, um, you know, flight from essentially civil war in parts of Somalia, uh, driven in part by climate change, um, they they leave their villages and their their, their huts, and uh, they haven't got paperwork. Even if they had it, they haven't got time to grab it, um, and they have nothing. 
And uh, many countries will not recognize people who've left. Um, they don't, they're not given nationality, they've got no evidence of nationality. Um, and uh, they are treated as stateless, and that makes it even more difficult for them to, to navigate the world in which they're in. But uh, perhaps I can say that one of the things we do at UNHCR is to provide country of origin reports, which are up-to-date uh, legal statements as to what the factual and, and legal position is. That should inform courts in making their judgments or judges and administrators when they when they make these decisions. But um, with my colleagues, we'll we'll explore a little further what you've just been saying. Thank you very much. I think. Uh, well, okay. So online question then, the UK government consistently cite the Australian experience as evidence that the Rwanda scheme will work to dissuade those seeking to travel across the channel and to, ta and to tackle the traffickers. How do we counter this argument? I'm, I'm glad you've got that one. <laughs> I should have stopped earlier. <laughs> it's, it's always the last question. <laughs> Thank you very much. And of course, it's more than justified, so I should be able to answer it. Um, the stop the boats save lives at sea, the, the slogans and the rhetoric and the policy worked. But you can do that in Australia because it's so far from anywhere. You can put what the government did, a, a cordon sanitaire along the northwest part of Australia with well-equipped Coast Guard vessels and, and uh, trained officers. They could literally stop it. You can't do that in the English Channel, and you can't do it in the Mediterranean. Uh, what could work in Australia will not work in most other parts of the world, and it's a phenomenon of, a, of Australia. It's been um, a very sad policy, but what's made it worse, of course, is that it's worked. And that now, of course, is something that will, um, uh, do, even with a more humane approach, uh, the new government is still implementing that policy. So uh, I, I think what I would ask people when the argument is made uh, is ask them to, to think um, that those policies are not possible. There are some similarities, and I will make this point out if I may, and that is that Papua New Guinea and the island of um, you know, Manus and Nauru are poor countries dependent on Australian aid and when they got large amounts of money to provide refugee services, um, it was a case of a very relatively powerful country taking advantage of a very poor, very poor and dependent countries. And I don't think you need to be very clever to see that that is a, an unacceptable situation. And that, of course, has been part of the worry of efforts at externalization, to pick countries which are, are, are poor, developing in need uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a place in which people can be, be transferred. Um, that is unacceptable on any ethical and moral ground to say nothing of, of the legal ground. So it's, it's, uh, it's deeply troubling. Thank you. I'm going to wrap things up very quickly because I do want you to be able to share um, some of what we have on offer down at the back. Um, can you all join me, though, in thanking again uh, Maura Smith, Lady Chief Justice, and Dr. Gillian Triggs. Thank you very much.